Good morning and welcome to Rich Thoughts for Breakfast. I'm Harold Herring and that's my fine wife Beth. Hallelujah. One of the favorite tactics of the enemy is to create an illusion which makes us think the problems we encounter are unique to us, that no one else has to face what we face. So yesterday we established three facts. First, the devil is a defeated foe. John 12, 31, John 12, 31, classic amplifier. We're going to let you look these up in the interest of time. John 16, 11, 16, 11, classic amplifier. Second, the devil is a liar. Amen. John 8, 44, John 8, 44, classic amplifier. Third, the devil has only three weapons he can use against us. The ability to deceive, tempt, and accuse. A deceiver lies. John 8, 44, John 8, 44, Living Bible. There is not an iota of truth in him. When he lies, it is perfectly normal, for he is the father of liars. The devil is also an accuser. We read about that in Revelation 12, 10. Revelation 12, 10. See, there, there through a variety of tricks, traps, lies, deceptions, and wiles, the enemy takes these three abilities and uses variations of them to create personal problems for believers like you, like me, like us. That's right. Number one, a review from yesterday. Grudges that embitter us. Leviticus 19.18, 19.18, Christian Standard Bible. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Holding a grudge makes a person unhappy, unhealed, and unsettled. An illustration of what a grudge can do, we shared it yesterday. We want to do it again. Take your two hands. Make two fists as tightly as you can. Now hold that. Continue clenching your fist as long as you can. How long do you think you can maintain the intensity of the clenched fist? I can tell you that after a short while, the clenched fist will begin to hurt. The clenched fist will become a major distraction, preventing you from doing anything else. You won't be able to work, sleep, drive a car, hold a baby, or most anything. Not only that, your focus will only be maintained. Although it'll be on maintaining the clenched fist. See, it'll take an increasing amount of energy to maintain those clenched fists, which keeps you from focusing on anything else. And that's how a grudge works. Ephesians 4.31 and 4.32. Well, Ephesians 4.31 we read yesterday, Classic Amplified. We'll read Ephesians 4.32 today, Classic Amplified. And become useful and helpful, kind to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely, as God in Christ forgave you. Mm. Number two, jealousy that robs us. When a worker, even a Christian, is found looking at what other people have, then that person will not be satisfied with what they have. Jealousy is nothing more than a trap, and it will eat your lunch and rob you of future blessings. Proverbs 14.30 Proverbs 14, verse 30 in the New Living Translation says, A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. And we need to remember Proverbs 14, verse 30 in the classic Amplified. Listen to what it says. A calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body. But envy, jealousy, and wrath are like rottenness of the bones. It's a great rendition. It is, really. It really is. Number three, loneliness that isolates us. This is another one we talked about yesterday. See, now let me tell you, there may not be a single person within miles of your current location, but you are never alone. Amen. Matthew 28, 20, 28, 20, classic amplified. Teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion, to the very close and consummation of the age, 
Amen, mm-hmm. so be it. We gave you seven ways to deal with loneliness. Just briefly, here's a review of that. First, you got to deal with the problem, understand it, so you can deal with it. Second, accept what cannot be changed. That might be the death of a spouse or moving away from a very close friend or changing of personnel even in the workplace. Third, change what can be changed. Reach out beyond your own needs to help someone else. Fourth, create new habits. A new routine or approach to life can create a freshness that will help perk you up. Number, well, fifth, make an effort to make new friends. One person each Sunday, common interest. And and go a little slow in the friendship. You don't want to smother the person. Sixth, get a pet possibly, particularly if you can afford it, but they're great comfort in times of feeling lonely. That's right. Seventh, spend more time with your best friend. And I'm not talking about the person you've known all your life or the one you go shopping with, or play golf with, or go fishing with. We're talking about the friend who will never leave you, nor forsake you, who's closer than a brother. Now let's pick up where we left off yesterday. Hallelujah. Amen. Number four. Sorrows that discourage us. You know, it's important that we understand sorrow is generally caused by the loss of someone or something. According to dictionary.com, sorrow means Distress caused by loss, affliction, disappointment, grief, sadness, or regret. Here are four questions and answers that help us, each of us, really, in dealing with whatever sorrow may come our way. Number one, does anyone know what I'm going through? That's a common question for all people, like we've said earlier. The devil likes to make you think it's only you. Yes, he does. Exodus 3, verse 7. Exodus 3, 7 in the classic Amplified. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters masters and oppressors, for I know their sorrows and sufferings and trials. Truly, the Lord does know and understand everything we feel. And in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, it tells us exactly how. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, in the, this is in the classic Amplified, describing Jesus. It says, surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment, yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God, as if with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquity, the chastisement needed to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Can anybody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Number two, why do my sorrows make me feel so broken? Our Heavenly Father is drawn to those who feel broken by the sorrows, the pain of daily living. Psalm 5117, 5117. King James, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. Isaiah 66, 2, 66, 2. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite, smitten, dejected spirit, and trembleth at my word. Number three. Is there anything I can do to be delivered of these sorrows? God always brings us peace to every troubled, broken, sorrowful, sad, and difficult situation. In Acts 17, verse 27, Acts 17, verse 27, it says that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And number four. Is there any way for the sorrows I've experienced to bless another? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. One of your favorites. It is. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 in the Message Bible. All praise to God and the Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. Here it comes. He comes alongside us 
when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside, brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times so that we can be there for them just as God was there for us. I don't really have time to get into it today, but that is one of my favorite scriptures, and God used it at a very significant point in my life. Someone may, someone may ask or others may ask, but Brother Harold, is there anything else we can do? Absolutely. Go to YouTube and search for the song, Trading My Sorrows, and listen to it repeatedly every time you feel a little bit of melancholy. If I had a different voice, I'd sing it, but I'm going to read it to you. You can sing it. No, you go. <laughs> I'm trading my songs. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. And we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. It continues, I'm pressed, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. And his joy is going to be my strength. Amen. That's scripture. Yeah. Through the sorrow may, though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you, listen to that song, it'll pump you up, perk yes, you up, make you feel better. Amen. Number five, finances that stress us. Hmm. <laughs> Some years ago, I was on an airplane flight, and the man sitting next to me said, what kind of work do you do? I told him I teach people how to get out of debt. He leaned back and said, I got a lot of debt, but I don't worry about it. I said, really? He said, yep, I sleep like a baby. I just wake up every couple of hours and cry about it. <laughs> Listen, if you've been stressed about your finances, you're not alone. Mm. I saw a recent survey that said only one out of ten people are not stressed about their finances. Notice that I chose to frame that sentence in the most positive perspective. Wow. When stress is high and the bank account is near empty, some people living in financial stress will often cause a person or family to stop going to church. The one place where they can find comfort, relief, and strength. The enemy will suggest the enemy will suggest that you stay home because you don't have money with which to tithe or give offerings. That is the worst possible thing you could do if you're living in financial stress because it'll close the windows of heaven over your life. Yet, it is a favorite tactic of the enemy. He knows that if you don't die, if you don't give offerings, you've just restricted, if not eliminated, your ability to bounce back financially. Mm. And that's the truth. Wow. Well, we're not going to finish today either, baby. Wow. We'll pick it up again tomorrow. If you've been blessed by the teaching, go to HaroldHerring.com. Up at the top where it says, Sow a seed. Just ask God what seed he'd have you sow. Do what he says. That's all we ever ask. And until tomorrow morning at 8.30, God bless you. Happy trails. And keep thinking rich thoughts. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>